All right, welcome to Prevention Institute's webinar titled Promoting Connectedness for Trauma and Suicide Prevention, Needs and Opportunities to Address Social Isolation During a Pandemic. This webinar is part of a project supported by a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information provided here do not necessarily represent the official views of the Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC or Prevention Institute. So during today's conversation, please feel free to use the text chat to join in. We're going to start that off right now with an initial question. What is one source of connection in your community during the COVID-19 pandemic? So let us know in the text chat and we'll circle back in a minute or two to share what's coming up. So during today's session, we wanna talk about why social connection is important for trauma and suicide prevention, how agencies and organizations are maintaining connectedness during the pandemic and what roles local partners can play. And we also wanna consider policies that will help address social isolation in the long term. We'll start with a little bit of context and then we'll move into conversations with specific panelists about their work before coming back together for a joint Q and A. We may not be able to answer all the questions you submit in this hour and 30 minutes, but we hope it can spark ideas and actions moving forward. So let's turn back to the chat and see what some sources of connection are in your communities during COVID-19. Alicia, what, what's coming up in the chat? Yeah, there's a lot coming in and participants, as you're responding, please um, mark off panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your response. Um, but it looks like folks are sharing a lot in terms of like schools, faith-based organizations, uh, hotlines, uh, virtual telehealth and just virtual communities that are happening, virtual uh, community events that are still happening. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that I'm seeing. Great, and those responses are still flowing in. So thank you all so much for sharing some different sources of connection. So we're, we're here talking about social isolation and loneliness, um, two issues that have received increased attention in recent years in the US and, and around the globe. Um, and for good reason, uh, prior to the pandemic, even by the most conservative estimates, loneliness uh, affected over one in five adults. And in a health affairs policy brief earlier this year, uh, expert Dr. Julianne holt lundstad discussed methods of measurement and various markers for social, social isolation, concluding that evidence points to a significant portion of the American population as socially disconnected in some way. While seniors are one of the most talked about populations at increased risk for social isol isolation and loneliness, these issues affect people of all ages. And we're focusing on the issue of social isolation in our conversation today because social isolation in addition to a number of other um, health consequences and negative health outcomes, it increases families' risk of exposure to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And social isolation and ACEs are both risk factors for suicide. Barriers to engaging with others can put people at increased risk for social isolation. Uh, for example, some of these are lack of accessible and affordable transportation options poor health and well-being, disabilities, unemployment or leaving the workforce, um, and also exposure to domestic or co community violence, just to name a few. So during the, the, the pandemic, necessary shelter in place and physical distancing has further impacted people's ability to engage with others. In a survey of over 2000 adults conducted by AARP Foundation and United Health Foundation, nearly three quarters of respondents agreed that the pandemic has made it more difficult for them to connect with friends. And that same survey found that two thirds of adults report having experienced social isolation during the pandemic and about the same number report that a loved one has experienced social isolation. And so in addition to, so to isolation due to the pandemic, some people are feeling particularly lonely during the winter and holiday season. And so now is a time where we need social connection and meaningful daily interactions more than ever. Research shows connectedness may protect against suicide by decreasing isolation, encouraging coping, increasing belonging and building resilience. And the CDC's technical package to prevent suicide recommends 
um, as part of promoting connectedness, peer norm programs and community engagement activities. For young people, connection to caring adults and activities can buffer against the impact of childhood trauma. Mentoring and after school programs are two approaches described in the CDC's technical package to prevent adverse childhood experiences. And yet programming has faced additional challenges during COVID-19. Shelter in place and physical distancing can make typical activities more difficult to maintain or initiate. We've had to figure out how to keep ourselves and our communities socially connected while remaining physically distant. Um, this is an image from our partners at Vital Village that speaks to that need to physical distance rather than social distance. And so today we're here to learn about what some orga organizations and agencies across the country have been doing during the pandemic to promote connectedness. I am so pleased to introduce our panel, including Edward Garcia of the Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness, Tony Diaz of After School Matters, Emily Allen of AARP Foundation, and Chris Bifolco and Annette Marcus of the Association of Oregon Community Mental Health Programs. And with that, Alicia is going to start us off with our first panelist. Thanks for getting us started, Alexis. Uh, I think that context is really helpful. And I think uh, Eddie is also going to help us in thinking more about this. So Eddie Garcia is the co-director of the Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness. And Eddie, before you get into more of the specifics around what you do, since you co-direct the coalition with social isolation and loneliness in the title, I'd like to ask you, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, um, thank you for asking the question, actually. It's because there is a big difference. Um, and really the, the, the largest at the highest level is that social isolation is more of an objective measure um, of connection versus loneliness is more of a perceived or subjective measure of connection. But specifically, it's social isolation is looking at a state in which the individual lacks the sense of belonging or, or socially, or lacks connections to others um, physically. Um, loneliness is really that, again, that perception of, of, of those feelings. So it can occur in the presence or in the absence of social isolation. Um, often it's described as a subjective feeling, as I mentioned, of isolation and not belonging or lacking com companionship. Um, really looking across both though, we think about it in a, a structure, a framework on social connection and, and really applying that, um, we really look at structural issues. So that's things like marital status or physical isolation, um, a functional factors, which are perceptions of social, um, of, of a lack of social supports or perceived loneliness and then the quality of the connections, which are things like marital strain um, or divorce. That's really helpful. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought social connection into this as well, since that's really the title of our web conference and we're really thinking about this strengths-based lens. Um, so can you tell us now a little bit more about the coalition and you know, what did it really set out to do even before the pandemic? Yeah, thank you, yeah, um, we appreciate that. Um, so the coalition was formed about three and a half years ago um, uh, with, with the mission to really promote awareness around social isolation and loneliness, um, primarily through policy and advocacy work um, with Congress um, and the administration. Um, our vision is for all Americans to have the opportunities uh, and supports necessary to be socially engaged in society. And our members are a very diverse group, multi-stakeholder groups, all organizationally based, um, but we have health plans, health systems, providers, employers, um, social service entities, technology innovators, um, and, and many more. We have about 30 um, organizations broadly um, and representing the sort of uh, uh, mental and behavioral health community as well. So we have APA, National Council on Behavioral Health, et cetera. That's really helpful to get that context and sounds like a really great group coming together. Um, so what is this foundation for social connection? Yeah, so, you know, coming out of our first, you know, three years together as under the coalition, as I mentioned, we really focused on advocacy and policy work um, to infuse these sorts of policies into the variety of healthcare systems, social service systems, looking at infrastructure um, and education. Um, and policies to spur um, programs and funding and supports around uh, these, these issues. Um, 
you know, coming out of that, we saw a great opportunity for us to focus on additional levers um, that would help to enrich both that policy platform, um, but also to help spur um, innovations um, and interventions in the market. Um, so with that, we, we formed the Foundation for Social Connection um, just about five months ago, excuse me. Um, and the, the foundation, as, as you put it, really on the positive um, um, side of this, is looking at translating the evidence uh, and scientific evidence base into real world application through our scientific advisory council. And glad to see that you highlighted our chair, Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstedt. Um, and there we're focusing on, on, we've brought together 10 different academic researchers um, from a variety of different expertise and backgrounds. Um, some anthropologists, some focused on families and, and children, many on geriatrics. Um, we have an economist, um, all focused on social isolation and loneliness around a variety of projects to further the evidence base. Um, there we're looking at things like establishing a, an international classification for function. And I know that Melissa's on from the CDC who was supporting us in that work as well. Um, we're looking at um, increasing um, screenings across states um, and including a, a variety of um, questions into things potentially like the behavioral risk factor uh, surveillance system potentially um, and a variety of other uh, funding other projects around research um, so that we can use that to um, inform our, our policy platform on the coalition side but also to inform our innovation network uh, work here and there we're establishing a variety of forums um, specifically focused on the development an incubation of interventions that fill a gap um, in the current landscape. Um, we're doing that with, with funders, with uh, again, like all the sorts of members that are part of the coalition. So health plans, health systems, social service system, systems. We're looking for um, any interested party um, that's interested in the development of an intervention. And that's where we focus really for the next phase of our work under the foundation. I really like how you're bringing together research and practice and focusing on that innovation and what can communities be doing and where is their evidence base and really building the evidence base from, from work in communities too. Um, you mentioned policy and some of the, you know, you mentioned the coalition has some policy goals. Can you share a little bit about that um, and also what's really been coming up in terms of uh, policy in, in response to the pandemic as well? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so the coalition focused on five uh, broad uh, goals and policy goals, and they're highlighted here. So the first was to increase public awareness of social isolation and loneliness and its effect on health and well being. Um, second is to enhance social services um, and support to address social isolation and loneliness. Also, looking at advancing health services and supports, um, really leveraging innovative technology solutions and spurring the development of those solutions to foster connection. And then finally, advancing research to develop uh, the evidence base um, as necessary. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, over the last three years, um, you know, we've focused primarily uh, in this policy space um, and focused very much on older Americans initially. Um, so the coalition was successful in including a variety of policy um, principles within the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act um, with our members. Um, so that's entities like National Coalition uh, on Aging, um, the National Area Agencies on Aging as well, um, Meals on Wheels America and others who, are, who have a population of, of older Americans. Um, and, and in there we had things like screenings and, 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 program, and funding programs um, for outreach um, uh, around socialized connection. Um, moving forward and with, with COVID-19, uh, we've done a lot more work um, really looking at in, on the mental and behavioral health impacts um, of, of COVID-19, uh, excuse me, of social isolation and loneliness in response to the COVID-19 stay-at-home orders. Um, so we've we focused um, much more in that mental and behavioral health space um, and on um, expansion of um, broadband access and telecommunications um, and telehealth services. Um, uh, to, to leverage in, in this time. Um, that, that's really where we've um, seen a lot of development. Um, we do a lot of work also on thinking about the health system play here. So a lot on telehealth and remote patient monitoring. Uh, we've also brought in a number of coalition members uh, focused in this technology space um, over the last several months. 
as we've seen sort of payment systems open up um, within the healthcare side to allow for um, a broader use of uh, telehealth services, which have been, we um, are starting to see a lot more movement toward um, support in the social isolation and loneliness space. Okay. Yeah, and it sounds like, um you know, COVID-19 in 2020 has been a really difficult year, but it's propelled some of these advancements and especially in kind of the telehealth and that kind of space. And, you know, even thinking about what was shared in the text chat in the beginning from participants here today, a lot of people spoke to virtual programming as well, whether it's, you know, social Zoom meetings or all of that. And so thinking about access to broadband and uh, internet computers seems really important in this time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what else has the coalition been doing uh, in response to the pandemic to better support uh, connection in this context? Yeah, so um, our members, uh, which is no surprise, and we just talked on it, um, everyone's been switching to virtual deployment um, and thinking through where and how that's a appropriate for specific populations. Um, we have, I have to highlight just three members here. So Pix Health um, um, is a, a digital platform that allows for screening uh, of, um, of individuals. Um, it has an AI robot or bot that's uh, in incorporated into the platform that learns from the user um, um, and is right on their, you know, their sort of iPhone um, or their digital platform um, and uh, um, interacts with them and connects them to resources based on a variety of different triggers that um, they've supplied um, over time into the system. Um, that's one solution that we've seen really start to explode um, over this, um, the last nine months, um, really take off and as more entities are partnering with them to deploy this tool. Meals on Wheels America has been doing a tremendous amount of work on social isolation and loneliness um, for a very long time. Um, and most recently over the last nine months has also started to do a tremendous amount of research around um, what digital tools um, are effective um, and which aren't, um, and for what populations. Um, so really building out an evidence base, um, starting to really dive into that even deeper uh, than they had. And then of course there's Papa Pals, uh, which is an entity that's an intergenerational program looking at linking um, younger adults um, with older Americans. Um, and um, you really, their, their tagline is a, a family on demand. Um, so it's, um, it was in person prior to COVID um, and they've gone to a completely virtual, obviously, um, platform for connecting with um, older Americans with uh, the younger generation. So across the board, um, a lot of movement toward virtual, um, both looking at deployment of technology, um, but also looking at the research on the impact um, and effectiveness of this technology in this time period. And I'm really glad that you brought up kind of the populations of focus too, and thinking about what works for different populations. We know that certain groups are already at higher risk for social isolation pre-pandemic, and um, that seems you know, even more important right now. Um, but those are really helpful examples. Um, Eddie, also thinking about our audience here today, you know, we did a poll at the beginning, we saw we've got some local government, we've got some state government, we've got community-based organizations. How can groups like this kind of really support connection and the types of policy goals that you've been talking about that sort of thing. What, what are some of your recommendations there? Yeah, well, um, a shameless plug, I'd invite everyone here to um, join the coalition. It has been organizationally based, um, but we've recently opened it up um, at an individual membership level. Um, and through that, um, we're um, able to, sh we'll be sharing information across both community-based um, organizations and more nationally based organizations. Um, both at our policy level, but also on sort of just industry trends, I'll call it, on what's happening on, you know, on the ground. Also through our foundation work, um, we are overlaying our feedback loop and creating a feedback loop with Robert Johnson Foundation's um, um, communities um, that are, are addressing social isolation and loneliness. Um, and we're looking to build that out. Um, so would love to have involvement there. Please reach out to me on either front um, to talk about getting involved. Um, and becoming a member. Um, so we can go to the next slide, which I know has your information on it. And we do have a question in the chat. I'm wondering if being a member is free or what the costs are with that. Sure, so um, please reach out. But I think at the individual level, we've placed it at $50 um, 
uh, for the individual and, and getting the, the information through there. At an uh, organizational level, um, for a, a large organization, um, we do have a different tier structure. I'm happy to talk about that offline. Great. And you can definitely visit the coalition's website too for more details on the work that they're doing and the policy priorities. So thank you, Eddie. And we are going to invite you back at the end with the rest of our panelists. But Great. we're Thanks now. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're now going to move to uh, Oregon. But before that, I do want to launch another uh, ch text chat question, which again, please uh, send it to all participants, attendees, and panelists so that everyone can see your responses. Um, we're wondering what types of actions have you taken to support connectedness in your community amidst the pandemic? And it doesn't have to be something really big. It can be, you know, anything, whether it's a one-time thing or something that you've been doing throughout. So please share in the chat and we'll come back and see what's coming up because we know there's so much expertise among the group that's here today. So with that, I'm going to introduce our next set of guests. Um, if we can go to our next slide, perfect. Um, so we've got Chris Bufulco, um, who is the Connect uh, Postvention Training Coordinator with the Association of Oregon Community Mental Health Programs. And Chris sits on the LGBTQ Advisory Group for the Oregon Alliance to Prevent Suicide. And we're also joined by Annette uh, Marcus, who is the Suicide Prevention Policy Manager at the association and staffs the Alliance to Prevent Suicide. So thank you both for joining us. And I'm wondering if you could start off by sharing how Oregon has been able to support social connections during this time. Sure, and, and thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, there are multiple simultaneous efforts happening to prevent, uh, to promote social connection right now. Um, some of the ones that we'll just call out real quickly uh, an organization called Lines for Life has been hosting uh, half-hour check-in calls for what for helpers across Oregon, anybody considered essential workers, anybody um, who considers themselves a helper and needs a little bit of extra processing time and community can join them on that. Um, Basic Rights Oregon has been hosting weekly town halls for folks to uh, learn more about LGBT specific issues. The trauma Healing Project has hosted a huge webathon um, to talk about trauma and things like that. And then what Annette and I are here to talk about today is this LGBTQ specific mini grant project that we developed in collaboration with the Oregon Health Authority, um, their public health and health services divisions uh, to get some mini grants out into the community statewide uh, to address some of these needs that were impacted by the COVID crisis. Um, this was really informed, I think, by the Healthier Together Oregon plan, which is something that um, informs a lot of our, our health services here. Um, we wanted to be sure that we could keep things real and meaningful in this mini grant project in a time where, you know, there's a lot of social toxicity. Um, we're, we're right at the beginning of the start of the most recent racial justice uprising movement. Um, and there's just so much that folks are dealing with on top of the pandemic. Um, so through that Healthier Together Oregon plan, we have uh, it's explicitly written that there are the values of equity and social justice, empowerment, making sure that what we do is strength-based, uh, that we have authentic community input into what's happening um, in terms of funding, in terms of developing programs, and accountability built in right there. So um, we created this mini grant project and our goals were to use community strengths and knowledge to boost protective factors um, within LGBTQ communities, um, uh, we wanted to create opportunities for life-affirming connections, um, re increase resources, increase maybe access to healthcare for vulnerable um, populations. And really moving away from a lot of grants might be into capacity building, professional development opportunities, and we're really focusing on what are these survival and connection needs right now? What are, what are communities really feeling like they need? And um, I want to do a quick shout out. We didn't use this framework um, when we developed the, the plan, but in talking with some colleagues, it's come to my attention. I think it's something that we should be talking about, especially as funders and fund seekers, um, is this idea of community centric funding, which holds all of those sort of values of being uh, motivated by racial justice, social justice, 
and uh, mutual aid. It's kind of a blend of those two, which is something that we don't often see in funding right now in fund seeking. So that's something that um, our project has kind of approached blending that and something that I just wanted to call out a little bit more explicitly so folks are aware. Thank you. That's so, it's so impressive what you've been able to do and especially, you know, acting really quickly. And I know these kinds of setting up these kinds of programs takes time and isn't easy. And so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about the process that you went to to actually implement this program. Sure. Um, so really this program, I think, evolved, speaking of, of social connections, is because of a lot of previous work that has happened in Oregon. Um, the Oregon Health Authority uh, applied for SAMHSA funding to address suicidality and particularly to address the needs of the LGBTQ uh, population. It brought together two uh, parts of the Oregon Health Authority, public health and, and um, health services division. And once they got the money though, they, they really thought we need to get this into the hands of real people quickly. And um, as Chris mentioned, this all happened kind of at that explosive moment where I think across the country, people kind of are waking up who have not been woken up before about uh, issues of, of racism and kind of needs of very marginalized communities. And um, OHA really determined that they wanted to support the LGBTQ community. And so they reached out to the Oregon Alliance to Prevent Suicide, which is actually an advisory council to OHA. Um, but part of our, our alliance is an LGBTQ advisory group. So that's a group that's meeting together regularly to think about um, how our communities impacted uh, and really identified that, that we are concerned about both the um, isolation from community because community has been such a huge source of strength and often of our own defined families. <laughs> uh, and a lot of LGBTQ folks are, we're really feeling like we're cut off from um, both our, our families we were born into and from our families of choice uh, through the COVID-19 uh, process. So in designing the, the process to make a low barrier grant, worked closely with the LGBTQ advisor group and the Oregon Health Authority in a really kind of nice partnership, thinking about how do you make it low barrier? How do people get, how do we get the word out to networks so that it won't just be kind of the usual suspects who apply? Um, and we have in place the Oregon Health Authority contracts with the Association of Oregon Community Mental Health Program. And uh, by contracting this, uh, this funding through AOCMHP, uh, they, it's allowed for a more quick turnaround of the money and um, being able to individually interact on a regular basis for these very small grants of $20,000 or less. Um, <clears throat> they also determined that they wanted there to be staffing from a trauma-informed Oregon. Oregon's made a really deep commitment to a trauma-informed approach and uh, Oregon Health Authority is really trying to integrate those approaches in, in much of their work. And then um, very importantly, provided staff support uh, through, with Chris, uh, who is helping to administer the grants, but also serving really as a resource uh, person for folks. So that, that was the process we came through. And then actually, once we got the grant, put the applications out, the LGBTQ advisory group reviewed all of the applications and made the recommendations to the Oregon Health Authority who ultimately made the final decisions about who, who was funded, uh, but worked very closely throughout the whole process. Great, yeah, it sounds like the partnerships are really important to making this happen. And I love the way you were so intentional um, about the process and about making it low barrier. Um, so can you, you know, detail a little bit more around the application process and then also kind of get into the kinds of, what kinds of groups did you end up funding? Yeah, you know, Alicia, just before Chris jumps in on that, there's one other point I wanted to make, which is I think this would not have happened if there wasn't engaged leadership at Oregon Health Authority willing to try something different. 
and and really listen to the community and and so i i just have to appreciate that yeah past you chris to talk about the process sure um so as you can see on the slide here um uh, we had a uh sorry this application process which and as Annette had mentioned, we wanted to make it as low barrier as possible. So the application was about one page long, um, seven questions, and just asking uh, folks to kind of give us their ideas for um, what would help their community to be able to respond to some needs. Uh, and we are obviously coming from a suicide prevention lens uh, through the Oregon Alliance to Prevent Suicide. So we did want to have some sort of connection to that, but we explicitly stated that we encouraged organizations um, or community groups, didn't even have to be a 501c3, um, really open to anybody uh, to, who hasn't even uh, specifically focused on suicide prevention work before to consider applying and to give us whatever idea that they had. Um, and we did that because, you know, whether or not they think they're doing suicide prevention work, they're doing suicide prevention work in increasing connections with folks in under being community based and community rooted and understanding, um, you know, this is a need that I'm seeing. And if, you know, needs create stress, and that's something that, you know, if we can help folks there, then we can ultimately, you know, see that as a suicide prevention approach. Um, and so some of our criteria there. We asked that uh, these grant projects to increase protective factors. We listed some of what those are because protective factors is kind of a, uh, a specific framework that maybe some of these organizations hadn't come across before. So it was important to us uh, not to have our kind of language be a barrier, I guess. We wanted to make sure that, that folks could connect with our, our opportunity as well as possible. Um, we also were able to give further priority to um, BIPOC communities, so Black, Indigenous um, communities of color, disabled communities or disabled serving organizations, uh, rural and frontier communities. We wanted to make sure that we could get our funding out as broadly as possible and to make it as equitable as possible, especially for maybe some of these smaller community groups that might not be able to access um, grants that are specific for nonprofits, or um, groups that maybe aren't established yet and just sort of coming together because they're seeing a need from COVID um, and those sort of things. I also wanna mention um, that the reason why for our process we were focusing on the LGBTQ community is because uh, we know that our LGBTQ youth are at really great risk. Uh, so I saw somebody mentioning in the chat the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Survey from the CDC and in our Oregon version of that, um, We've learned that 50% of LGBTQ youth have considered suicide in the past year, um, that 25% report having made an attempt in the past year, and that's two times greater than our uh, cis or uh, straight heterosexual students. So we're seeing a high need for connection for prevention activities uh, with our youth, and that includes you know, support from their community, from their families, those sort of things. Um, and we also know that nationally, LGBTQ folks tend to have lower rates of employment, um, so they might be unemployed or underemployed. And adding on to the COVID crisis, um, a lot more people are finding themselves unemployed or underemployed, so we know there's going to be greater impact here. And also, uh, for something that folks might not know, is that Portland, Oregon has the second highest uh, LGBTQ population in the nation. The only city that has more is uh, the District of Columbia. So we know that we have a really high concentration of folks here within this community. And then we wanted to also focus on those intersecting identities that might be experiencing more systemic oppression that we need to be able to address. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, <laughs> so that no, we can I think uh, keep having... moving along having that context um, locally in Oregon and sharing kind of overall risks um, in LGBTQ populations is, is really helpful to understand um, the question that's on my mind and I'm sure others today here are curious about. So who, what are the kinds of groups you're funding and how are they supporting social connection? 
Sure. Uh, so we ended up receiving 80 applications, which was about four times as many as we thought we would get, which really speaks to uh, that there's a big need for this population. Um, and those 80 applications represented 30 out of the 36 counties in the state which again is really fantastic. So it's a big state, people are pretty far spread out in terms of population. To, so to be able to see that reach um, was, was really great. And I just have here on the slide, um, the numbers in each bubble are a little bit hard to see, but I tried to, to just show how many projects are funded in each area. And in the smallest area um, at the top of the map, um, there's actually six projects in that area. And in that county is where Portland sits. Um, so Portland uh, metro area actually has 60% of the whole state population. So we really wanted to make sure we kept in mind um, population distribution as well as geographic distribution of these grants. So um, about a quarter of our applications were from that area and 30% of the projects that we ended up funding were from that area. Um, we also want recognize that in getting such a huge response to this project, we sort of ended up with an informal needs assessment process. So we have all this great information about um, about a community that maybe we haven't been reaching out to as much before or haven't been hearing from as much before. And so now we're working on mapping out um, a descriptive model of different approaches to suicide prevention, uh, social connectedness, all of these things that uh, range from harm reduction approaches all the way through liberatory approaches. So we're seeing such a wide array of things. Um, in the end, we were able to fully or partially fund 18 grant projects um, that represented 14 counties, and some of them even have statewide reach. And you can, um, on our website for the Oregon Alliance, there's actually a list of all of the different projects that were funded along with a little um, summary of each project and organization. So if folks wanna check out more about that, um, they can uh, on that website. And generally our projects ranged from even connections with the self. So organizations that maybe do mental health services uh, saying, you know, we need to have the ability to provide people sessions for free right now. So if you could help us fund that, um, we'd love to do that, along with um, having some funds available to help uh, trans clients with name changes and gender marker changes, uh, where financial ability uh, or even sometimes in filling out those forms and understanding what's going on can be a really big barrier. Um, so we saw projects like that. We saw projects uh, that would connect youth with their families. The Central Oregon Disability Support Network um, did a series of uh, a series of web meetings that were kind of scaffolded. One was for youth, one was for youth and parents, and then one was an online resource fair, which actually a lot of the grantees were able to participate in, which was really cool. So we're building connections across the state among grantees as well. Um, and for this project with the HIV Alliance, um, they have created a, they're, they're one of the ones that provide mental health services, but in their partnership with Transponder, they also have opened up a weekend call line so that they can call in with people in their community and make sure, just have check-ins and say, hey, how's it, how's it going? And have these friendly connections that are reliable um, that will be coming to people rather than people having to reach out for them. Um, so that's been really exciting to see. And as you can see for uh, this group, we have a lot of communities who are also uh, really affected by wildfires earlier this year, back in September. So we're kind of meeting extra needs with that as well. Um, and then one more, a couple more that I, I wanna call out, um, hoping that I have a little bit of time to do that. Uh, we have an organization that works specifically with older LGBTQ folks. Um, so their their project really centered around uh, technological uh, support. So being able to get iPads for their participants, or even uh, there's a version called a grand pad, which is a simplified sort of iPad, um, as well as some training for um, 
for these older adults to learn how to use the technology so that they can stay connected with their friends and family, even if they have to be physically distanced. Um, and then we also had two other categories that I'd like to call out, one that were specific to being able to support mutual aid efforts in their community, um, and ones that were specific to connecting people with their culture. So whether that was um, through indigenous uh, gatherings, through uh, Black community-specific gatherings and connecting with um, traditional African healing methods and those sort of things, um, we just have such a wide gamut of, yeah. of applications of grantees. Seems like you received some really good uh, applications and you're able to fund some really great groups. I know we have a quote here from one of them on the slide. And some of the things you're saying also seem to be similar to the types of things that uh, our participants on the web conference today have done as actions in their communities. I've seen things like curbside pickups and virtual circles and phone check-ins and all sorts of different ways that people are staying connected. I think care packages, postcards, lots of different ways um, that people are trying to keep connected in their communities. Um, I wanna thank Chris and Annette for uh, sharing and we'll again bring you back at the end with all of our panelists. Um, but I'm gonna hand it off to Alexis now and she's, we're gonna move from Oregon to Illinois, specifically Chicago. Thanks so much, Alicia. I'm really pleased to introduce Tony Diaz, who's the Senior Program Director at After School Matters. Tony supervises a program management staff and a team of more than 300 instructors to provide nearly 10,000 opportunities annually to teens on Chicago's north and west sides. He has worked for the organization for more than 12 years and has dedicated his career to delivering high quality after school and summer programming to, to underserved youth. Tony, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about After School Matters overall? Sure. So um, our team of staff and instructors provide life-changing after school and summer program opportunities for high school teens across the entire city of Chicago. So nearly every zip code, every corner of Chicago, um, we provide programs for our, our teens. And for 30 years, After School Matters has supported hundreds of thousands of Chicago teens in the development of their strengths, confidence and futures while also supporting them and their families financially through a participation stipend, which is what makes us very unique. Um, and we've built an asset model for Chicago and all of its communities, one that really takes a fresh perspective at youth engagement and development. We know that schools alone can't provide our, our Chicago teens with all the resources and opportunities that they really need to thrive. So we step in to help them discover and develop their passions and interests, whether it's in a robotics program or painting and drawing uh, or a boxing or journalism program. We, we really have a full gambit of different opportunities available for our teens. And the inspiration for uh, After School Matters arose more than two decades ago from the desire of then Chicago First Lady Maggie Daly and former Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner Lois Weisberg to develop some cultural activities for city's teen the city's teenagers. And so in 1991, uh, that's where the After School Matters predecessor, Gallery 37, was actually born. Uh, we're in large white tents on Block 30, what we call Block 37, which is an empty, was an empty lot in downtown Chicago. That was the first summer where approximately 260 teens apprenticed with professional artists and earned a monetary stipend for their work. Uh, the program was very popular and successful with our teens who were eager to learn from these caring mentors and adults um, that they worked very closely with who are experts again in their field. And they reported that Gallery 37 really helped them to express themselves through their chosen art form made them better communicators and introduced them to new career opportunities. 30 years later, which is now, which is crazy to think, um, After School Matters has engaged more than 350,000 Chicago teens and serves as one of the nation's largest and most successful providers of after school and summer programs for high school teens specifically. And uh, we're here to help, you know, we're help, here to help build a bright future for our Chicago and its neighborhoods by supporting our young people and those that are either currently in our programs or those that we hope to reach in the future. 
Thank you so much for that overview. I, I think it's it's a really a, um, impressive reach and program that you have. And um, we mentioned a little earlier in the webinar the um, CDC's technical package for preventing adverse childhood experiences. And After School Matters is one of the programs um, specifically included. And so just wanted to hear a little bit more about some of the evaluated benefits of After School Matters. Sure. So when it comes to our evaluated, the evaluated benefits, we're, we work very closely with many research institutions over the years to evaluate the impact of After School Matters programs on Chicago's teens. And consistently, they come back with the following major categories, which is when we're looking at high school impact compared to teen peers who do not participate in our programs, we consistently see stronger freshmen on track rates, higher school day attendance, or in other words, fewer school day absences, um, and higher graduation rates. Beyond high school, um, college enrollment and persistence, 73% uh, of our teens, our 12th graders specifically enrolled in college the fall after their graduation, compared to 65% of their school-based peers. And as we, as we know in Chicago, out-of-school time hours can be the most dangerous of, for Chicago teens. So After School Matters really strives to provide our teens with a safe space year round uh, where they can discover their passions again and develop their skills that will really help them achieve success in college um, and beyond. So when conducting surveys on our teens, we do pre and post surveys. Uh, they consistently report an increase in their 21st century skills, or in other words, their soft skill development, such as like planning for success, leadership, um, and public speaking. Um, and, and they consistently report an increase in those skills across, our, you know, through their participation in our programs. They also report um, how frequently they communicate with their program peers and instructors um, and completed a validated scale of perceived stress and questions about their experiences. And our preliminary analysis indicates that increased connection with peers and instructors positively correlates with teens identifying their program as a safe space for processing what they are going through and feeling supported and safely coping with difficult emotions. So as you can see, we're committed to building on these positive trends, even through these very, very challenging times. Um, and so that's why it's very important for us. And it was very important for us to think through um, creatively transitioning our programs, you know, during this pandemic as well. Right. And, and that's exactly kind of what we, I think, want to hear more about next, which is, you know, how did you what information did you use to inform, you know, how you would continue to create that safe space and continue to support teens in, in developing their skills? Um, what what informed your what has informed your approach this year during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Sure. So summer twenty twenty, as I think we all know, was one unlike many others, and so the COVID nineteen pandemic, as well as increased activism and public attention on systemic racism really changed you know, people's daily lives. So not only have schools fundamentally changed, but after school and summer programs have also been drastically impacted. Uh, the pandemic has transformed how many organizations coordinate and support programs, how adult staff design and implement them, and how our young people and their families participate um, and experience those programs that they're in as well. So in response to the pandemic, you know, After School Matters engaged in organization-wide planning and preparation efforts just to move in-person programs online, so remote. Um, the pandemic began uh, during our spring 2020 program session, where at that time we paused programs briefly, but then quickly switched gears to re a remote format for the first time in our 30-year history. So following that spring session, we surveyed nearly 3,000 of our teens from all over the city about things like technology and Wi-Fi access, engagement with their instructors and peers, food insecurity, and many more things. The results of that survey really informed our approach to summer programs, which is a program session where we offer, typically offer the most teen opportunities as well. And so After School Matters re-envisioned our summer session to provide more than 500 different remote programs to 10,000 teens in Chicago. And that's again, just for that summer session. And our remote programs offered a combination of one-on-one -on -one time with instructors, group collaboration time and individual work time to achieve various projects, again, across the 
various content areas that we offer our programs. Online program meetings occur three to five days a week through Google Meet, uh, to more so specifically align with Chicago Public Schools approach for ease and familiarity, since a lot of our teens are CPS students. They're already familiar with that platform since it's what they're using for their school day. Um, and again, we, we, we worked with our teens and, and provided them with um, program supply kits and tech devices where needed. Um, those were delivered directly to our teens' homes. And actually, I want to share a story about uh, one team that I actually know personally uh, through my work. Her name is Jasmine. Um, Jasmine's a high school senior now, um, and she's been a participant in one of our fashion programs since she was a freshman. So she's been in our programs now. This is her fourth year. And growing up as a kid in the north, on the northwest side of Chicago, she knew she was interested in fashion, but never really had touched a sewing machine or a needle before joining her ASM program. So the program, her uh, in, through her program uh, and her instructor, allowed her to tap into her interest in the field and develop both the technical skills that she needed, right, and then also the 21st century skills that really helped her to enhance um, her abilities. And this past summer, um, when programs were offered remotely due to the pandemic, unfortunately, Jasmine ended up getting COVID-19. Uh, but she shared that her participation in the program really helped her to stay positive during this very, very stressful time when all she would hear around her was how COVID had been impacting so many people around the world. And so her program really gave her like an outlet to, you know, just distract herself, distract her mind and, you know, thankfully beat COVID. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's easy to talk about the stats, but just wanted to share this example because it really sh shows the impact and what it really looks like in real life. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, really appreciate you sharing that story. Um, and I see we have a question from someone that will hopefully circle back to, um, or maybe you'll answer it kind of as you continue. Um, sure. But just wanted to hear a little bit more about um, you know, what After School Matters has done in response to the pandemic to better support connection. It's amazing that you were able to, to do hundreds of programs um, online, but sort of how did you, what did you focus your energy on when you were, when you were um, transitioning to uh, remote? Sure. So to support a successful shift in our program model and continue um, to provide engaging programming, um, ASM really focused on three priority areas. The first being program continuity, obviously. So as I mentioned, we quickly reorganized to provide remote programs for the very first time, starting with the spring program session and then continuing it into our summer session. Our staff and instructors uh, worked tirelessly to prepare, including compiling and hand delivering hundreds of supply kits to teen homes. And they could have, you know, in order for them to participate, they needed those kits and we wanted to make sure that their experience was very unique, right? And so that was really critical and important for us, whether teens participated in, again, a painting or robotics program or a culinary program or a sports program, we wanted to ensure that they had, you know, what they needed to be able to participate successfully and have a very uh, engaging experience. Uh, second, we, you know, wanted to make sure that we focus on financial assistance. So we continue to pay our teens and instructors through the spring session, even during the program pause and the summer. All of our programs are paid apprenticeships and internships. And this past summer, uh, teens earned a stipend anywhere between $336 and $850, depending on the length and level of expertise required of that particular program. Stipends are a core element to our program model. They lower participation barriers, reinforce the importance of dedicated participation in hard work in programs and make an economic impact on our teens, their families and the communities that they live in. So providing stipends to our teens, you know, it really empowers them and reinforces the value of their time and their efforts. And just to provide some data, just for the summer session alone, that meant a total of $5.1 million in teen stipends and nearly $2.1 million in instructor pay that was going directly back into those, their commun the communities and economies all across Chicago. And then finally, um, we focused on additional and just critical support services. So we expanded our traditional services to support relieving food insecurity. So we partnered with Gate Gourmet, which is the airline uh, caterer to help not only put their employees to work, but to also feed our teens and families at the same time. 
We're now working with uh, World Central Kitchen and the Greater Chicago Food Depository. And between the three programs, we're happy to say, to say that we've distributed more than 120,000 much needed meals across the, you know, across Chicago since the pandemic began. Um, we also were very focused on closing the digital divide um, to ensure that all of our teams had access to, to their programs. We ensured that they had um, the proper technology devices to participate in our program. So that was really important. We wanted to make sure that no team was, you know, uh, without, you know, an opportunity to be able to participate if they didn't have the means to. And then we, uh, it was important for us to provide mental health support. And so we partnered with Adler University to offer free telehealth counseling for individual teens. And counselors also visited uh, individual programs to conduct group sessions when needed about mental and emotional wellness, trauma and self-care. And this partnership has, has continued into the fall and it's allowed us to provide, again, free individual and group sessions for our teams and programs, which we know is just really important, especially during this time, because all of our teens are experiencing trauma in, in very different ways. And so that's been a really, you know, great benefit for us and really important for us during this time as well. Tony, I, I'm seeing comments in the chat or people are saying this is an amazing program, outstanding efforts and, um, I want to thank you also for, for touching on, you know, some of the partnerships have, that have been really key um, to, to your success and After School Matters success in, in um, adapting to the current conditions. Um, and we have a few questions, but I think we're going to save those um, for the joint Q&A um, and we'll be coming back to Tony. Um, and before we go to our next presenter, um, I do want to just uh, present another text chat question for the audience, um, which is who are some partners that you're working with to promote connectedness at this time? Tony shared a few. Um, let us know who are some of the folks that, uh, that you're working with. And we'll give just a second for, for folks to respond. I'm seeing the local school district is one. Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, Local School District, Miami's Together for Children, Community Healers. So um, a lot of different groups, Life Matters, Mental Health, um, a lot of different groups coming together to try and support co social connection during this time. Food banks, school staff, local government, Parks and Rec. So continue to tell us in the chat um, and we're gonna go ahead and move uh, into the next presentation, um, I'm pleased to introduce Emily Allen, who is the Senior Vice President of Programs at AARP Foundation. Uh, Ms. Allen leads a team of foundation innovators and social entrepreneurs to develop, to develop effective solutions that address the social determinants of health, health and help vulnerable, low-income older adults secure the essentials. In this role, she oversees AARP Foundation's longstanding national programs, like SCSEP, Tax Aid and Experience Corps, as well as new innovations designed to increase economic opportunity and social connections that help prevent and reduce senior poverty. Emily, welcome, thanks for joining. And can you tell us a little bit more about your work at the AARP Foundation? Sure, thank you, Alexis. Wow, this has really been just a rich conversation so far. And thank you and the Prevention Institute for putting it on, it's such an important topic. Topic. But yeah, I know you you hit it. Um, I, I am part of AARP Foundation, and many people are familiar with AARP, the, the enterprise that um, really focuses on um, the health and well-being of um, older adults um, and, and people 50 and older. Um, the, the enterprise is also made up of AARP Foundation, and that's where I sit. And we are actually the charitable arm or the charity charitable affiliate of the larger AARP enterprise. And um, our focus is really on particularly low-income older adults, be they AARP members or not. And we really focus in on, as you said, kind of two large goals around increasing economic opportunity and increasing social connection. And as you might imagine, those are two very interrelated issues. It's very difficult to be financially resilient 
you know, gain, you know, obtain employment and things like that without those important social social connections. So um, very exciting work. We focus a lot on, I think, a number of the topics that you have touched on today, particularly as a result of the pandemic. So we focus on, um, you know, a mission of creating and advancing the most effective solutions that help low-income older adults secure the essentials in life. So that can be, you know, a focus on food security, a focus on income security, a focus on making sure that, that people have access to affordable and safe housing. Um, and then again, really focusing in on um, the importance of social connections. You know, when, when we think about a basic need, we are in fact, as human beings, social creatures. And so um, we know that, that social connections are so, so critically important um, in order to have, you know, be health, have health and, and well-being as you age. Absolutely. And so what are some of the activities that were already underway prior to the pandemic um, that maybe have become even more critical now in supporting social connection? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, a number of years ago when we started focusing on particularly on social connection, um, we knew that social isolation affects nearly one in five older adults. Um, and so we knew, as I said, this really became a core issue for AARP Foundation to focus on. Um, you know, we really, you know, take a look at the fact that older adults often in our communities are marginalized and they're they're being left behind, whether it's because of the latest technology or just being marginalized overall in, in society. And so we know that that's you know social isolation was having a significant impact um, not only on individuals but on society. Um, you know, we, we have done a lot of work in looking at um, the research behind social isolation there. I'm glad you switched the, switched the slide, but isolation is truly a health issue. Um, it is, and, and, you know, research has shown that social isolation is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, and I, I never get over that stat because it always just, you know, it, it's so compelling um, you know, we don't, we, we know the devastating consequences of smoking on your health, but isolation is the same. And particularly in older adults, we see, you know, instances of higher blood pressure, susceptibility to viruses like the flu. And certainly as we think about the pandemic we're in now, greater risk of heart disease and even early onset of dementia. And so, you know, it, it's certainly an, an individual issue that we wanted to dig into. But we, we worked closely with our AARP Public Policy Institute to also look at the cost to society. And a recent report showed that social, iso social isolation among older adults is associated with an estimated $6.7 billion in additional Medicare spending annually. So it really ranks up there with the chronic diseases that um, we know are so costly to society. And so, you know, a lot of our work has been on raising awareness around the issue and the impact of social isolation. Um, one of the things that we launched, um, I believe it was in 2016, was a platform called connecttoeffect.org. And I can put that in the chat here in a little bit. Um, but it was, it was really designed, one, to raise awareness, you know, of the issue of social isolation. You know, we have so many people joining us today that that get it or are beginning to get the impact of social isolation on our communities and individuals of all ages. But at the time, you know, it was really relatively new to think about the impact of social isolation and loneliness amongst older adults in particular. So Connect to Effect was really designed to raise awareness, but what we realized is we don't want to raise awareness unless we can also provide some solutions. So Connect to Effect has continued to evolve into really being a central point where people can actually access tools and resources, learn more about solutions that are working. Um, one of the calls to action that we always recommend is we have an, a, a very easy to use assessment tool on the Connect to Effect platform that allows individuals to go on and either take the assessment for themselves or take it for someone that they're they're caring for or or love to determine what what's what's the, at the root of that social isolation. I'm so glad that Eddie earlier talked about the differences between social isolation and loneliness. 
Because unless we understand those differences and unless we understand the root of the, the challenges that somebody may be facing, then we're not, we're not going to hit the right solution. You know, so addressing loneliness among, you know, amongst an individual or with an individual would be different than if, if they were experiencing social isolation because um, of a health crisis or because of a lack of transportation or lack of access to technology. So we wanna make sure that people can go on and really understand why they may be experiencing it and then link them to best practices and solutions, evidence-informed solutions that help them address their level of isolation. So certainly that work was happening already. And we knew, um, like I said, the, the number of older adults that were experiencing social isolation. And then of course the pandemic hit and um, you know, individuals that were already experiencing social isolation were struggling. But then we had a, you know, so many new individuals coming to us who really were experiencing isolation for the first time. And so we wanted to make sure that we had that central point where people could access resources. Absolutely. And, and um, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, I saw Alicia and Cami drop that connect to effect.org in the chat so that folks can, can check it out. Um, but, you know, you've built on that. And I know that sometimes there's kind of a debate about um, the technology piece where it's, it's like, is technology a, a help or a hindrance? And so um, what are you learning at AARP Foundation from engagement in your platform about the potential of technology to help people become more connected with each other? Such a great, great question, Alexis. Really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I know, having been in this space for quite some time, the, particularly when you're talking about older adults, there are some that are very technology savvy, that have smartphones, that use tablets. Um, but we also know that either because of lack of access to technology or, um, you know, not being digitally savvy, that we're always going to have to have a hybrid model. You know, we want to use technology where possible because we want to reach as many people as possible. Possible. Um, but we know that's not going to be the sole solution. So we have really developed, um, you know, a, a kind of a hybrid model, if you will. We are using things like a platform, a web based platform like Connect to Effect, where we've seen, um, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of, of assessments completed, um, you know, over the last couple of years. We're, we also want to make sure that we're introducing things like chatbots and voice first technology. Um, we work closely with some of the largest providers of affordable senior housing to begin to think about how we might integrate things like a chat bot or AI or um, you know, uh, voice first technology, not as a replacement for human contact, that's not at all what, what we're focused on, but as a facilitator back to human connection. So when we think about a chat bot, um, which is something that's actually launched this year in March, as you might imagine, we had been working on this uh, chat bot for some time, launched in March, and then of course the pandemic hit. And what's been really interesting to see the interaction with the chatbot is we are very upfront on what it is. It is not a human, it is not a therapist, it is not any of those kind of things. But what we found and learned from the interaction is that people, particularly older adults, and I think it's important to point out that older adults are very often the last people to raise their hand and say that they need help. And so actually the chatbot um, I, the feedback that we got from users, and there's been literally, um, you know, as you see here, almost 100,000 individuals have interacted with the chatbot over the last several months, and, and some 60,000 have continued dialogue with the chatbot because it allows for some anonymity. It allows for people to, to be vulnerable without, you know, without really expressing that vulnerability to a person. But like I said, we never want to have technology replace human contact. But what we do is script the, the conversation so that we pick up on or the chatbot picks up on things that are said and then makes suggestions about how people may connect back 
Obviously, pre-COVID, we had a lot of scripting about getting out and joining groups or, you know, uh, going to your place of faith or whatever. We've adapted all of that scripting so that it's obviously pandemic friendly, if you will, and make suggestions about even in light of physical distancing, how might you connect back to friends, family, community um, as, as, a, as a way back into that social connection. But again, we also have to look at, yes, technology is great. But we also have supported work around things like warm lines. And I, I saw people um, putting in the chat things around crisis lines and things like that. We know that there's always going to be a need to have that human connection. So working with AARP, we've, we've um, stood up kind of a friendly voices uh, calling program. AARP Foundation has a helpline where as people have been struggling, whether it's with food security or just social connection or other type of types of acute need, they actually have a volunteer guide and navigator who can help them access important resources in their community. So we know it's always going to require a balance. Right. It sounds like a very kind of multifaceted, like you said, hybrid approach. Um, and, and so you mentioned a little bit about needing to kind of re-script um, in, in, to sort of be appropriate for the, the context of the pandemic, but what else, what other resources, what has AARP done um, in response to the pandemic that, to better support connection? Yeah, good question. I mean, one of the things that we're doing, and I kind of forget what, what's on the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so a couple of things, and you referenced, thank you for uh, for uh, the shout out on the recent report around um, the pandemic's effect on social isolation report that we did earlier this year, just to get insights into how it was um, impacting older adults. We're gonna continue that research. I mean, a big part of how we build solutions is one, working with partners, but also two, really conducting the research that helps us understand what the true needs and challenges are. The other um, recent research we did, um, we sponsored a National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, study that really looked at older adults and social isolation and really focused in on some of the recommendations, which um, one, really building um, evidence of solutions that were working. And so I love some of the things that came through in the chat. We know that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that's happening in community-based organizations across this country. We wanna surface those and understand better about what's working and what's not so that we can really strengthen the evidence base around solutions that address social isolation and loneliness. The second really key recommendation was to strengthen ties between healthcare systems and community-based organizations. Because healthcare can't do it alone, community-based organizations can't do it alone. But when we think about healthcare systems, that is one system that older adults are attached to. And so when we think about perhaps increasing the focus for healthcare providers to do screenings for social isolation, we want to make sure that we're strengthening the ties with community-based organizations that often have the programming and the solutions that can help address the needs. So we want to make sure that those ties are strengthened. So we're doing things like working with um, OCHIN, which is um, a nonprofit technology uh, firm focused on integrating things into like electronic medical health records for federally qualified health clinics. So we've integrated things like connect to effect into, into EHRs, which help provide a ready resource for individuals that may screen being at risk for social isolation now and in the future. Thanks, um, Emily. I also just wanted to skip as you were speaking to to your work with Ocean to this impressive uh, slide with all of the different partners and national network that um, you've been will, uh, you've been building um, over time. Uh, any sort of overarching thoughts on how collaboration has helped AARP Foundation advance social connection, particularly during the pandemic? Absolutely, yeah. No, and I, you know. Oops. My, I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, no problem. 
So yeah, I always hesitate to put up logos or, or start lists of partners because I, I can't include all of them. And I, 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 uh, I would include uh, Eddie's group or the coalition as well. Um, but here's just a snapshot of some of the organizations. And again, it has to be a cross-sector approach. So we are very purposeful about looking about at you know, groups like an Ocean or, you know, a Leading Age or N4A that Eddie referenced earlier. Also, like the providers of affordable senior housing, we knew we needed to learn from them and understand what was happening as a result of the pandemic. And as services were shutting down, how might we replace those services in a more virtual environment? So things like deploying technology and understanding how what the best methodologies for deploying that technology. But I also call out, um, we've done a lot of work, um, and again, Eddie and, and the coalition have been part of this as well, with ACL, the Administration for Community Living, really looking at building out a national network and developing a coordinating center focused on social isolation amongst older adults and people living with disabilities so that we can really build a, 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 a solid framework and a solid um, base for sharing of best practices, um, sharing of information, and really really developing a clearinghouse focused on what are those evidence of informed solutions, technology-based or programmatic, that help older adults and people living with disabilities connect back into their communities. So you're gonna see much more about this building, this national network. And we really encourage everyone to, uh, to be part and you know, stay tuned. There'll be a lot more to come over the coming weeks and, and months about that. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Emily. Um, we really appreciate you joining. And I think we're gonna go ahead and transition into our joint q and I'm gonna hand it over to Alicia. Thanks, Alexis. And if you can put it on to our next slide, that would be great. So I want to invite all of our panelists back together and um, have a little joint discussion. This is kind of my favorite time in the web conference. And, you know, the question I wanted to kind of dive into all together is, you know, thinking about where we are right now in the year, um, the in between holiday seasons and thinking about, you know, the end of the year that we're in. Um, how can community leaders support connectedness in safe ways during this time? You know, what, what's really coming up in terms of isolation at this time of year? And, you know, what are kind of your recommendations um, for local government and community-based partners during this time? And then even just thinking into the new year. So I'll just start off. Um, and what Emily was talking about our, through our work with the Administration for Community Living, um, subset of that has been looking at communication communications campaigns um, around the holidays um, and AARP is a tremendous leader in that space. Um, you know, I think the, um, you know, one thing that we're thinking of is as, um, you know, young adults or um, um, adolescents are coming home from wherever they are, um, uh, one, um, making them aware of the need to be thinking about social isolation and loneliness, not only for themselves, but for their, their grandparents or parents that are, are home or maybe homebound um, and, 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 um, and arming them with tools um, to one screen for that um, and, 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 and direct uh, resources for that. So like Emily mentioned, the Connect to Effect tool um, is available um, and can be used to sort of walk through, um, thinking through how to screen for that. Um, there are a variety of entities that are all have other screening tools um, and um, could be applied. So that's one, one idea I think that we're trying to raise awareness around um, that specific population, that specific situation right now. Mm, yeah, I like the consideration about intergenerational kind of dynamics as well. And since you mentioned some of AARP Foundation's work, Emily, do you wanna build upon that at all or add anything? Sure, no, thanks, Eddie. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I think there's a couple of things and I'm glad Eddie also you know, touched on broadband access and things like that. I, you know, that's not, I think just the focus on that and making sure that um, you know, access to technology and our access to broadband is just a fundamental need at this point. And I think that's been something that the, the pandemic has pointed out. So I think thinking ahead about how we make sure that whether it's a rural community or um, you know, 
cleaner housing or whatever it is. Um, and we've certainly seen that prompt around nursing homes and field nursing facilities and things like that. Um, the big part is, you know, and, uh, is really just whether you're an individual um, concerned about a, a parent or a loved one or you yourself, make a plan when it comes to the holidays specifically. Don't let it sneak up on you. It will be disrupted this year. We, we're not going to necessarily be able to travel to see family and friends. So just think about making a plan. And actually on Connect to Effect, we have some suggestions about making that plan for the holidays because that's where, where it really, it, it does, it kind of sneaks up, you know, I'm okay, I get it. We won't be able to have Christmas dinner or holiday dinner together, but um, you know, when, when, it, when you're in the moment um, and you're alone or, or really feeling lonely, then that's when it can really take its toll. So just make a plan for what you might do uh, during the times to make sure that you feel as connected as possible. Right. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, people can do that at the individual family level and then also thinking about the rules for um, local organizations and government and thinking about how to support um, their communities in those types of in that type of planning. Um, I want to see Tony or Annette, Chris, anything coming up for you? Yeah, hey, Alicia. So, so go ahead. I think somebody else was about to say something. You go, Tony. <laughs> oh, okay, so I was going to say, you know, After School Matters receives uh, funding through both the city and state to support our, the work that we do. And so one thing that's been really important, one thing that we've been doing a lot um, recently, actually, and, in, you know, even when we're in person, is inviting our elected officials, whether they be local aldermen or other women, and then also um, inviting our state senators to visit our programs and to really kind of allow our teams to really voice kind of themselves and, and really talk about the impact of our programs and what they're gaining through participation in our um, program activities. And that's been really helpful. I think our, you know, elected officials really get a lot of information from seeing the, the impact firsthand versus just kind of, you know, hearing about it or, or viewing, a, viewing it. And so it, it allows them to really be advocates uh, for our teens and our teens enjoy those opportunities as well because they are more involved in the process of understanding how you know city and state budgets work, and and have really been able to ask questions to our um, you know leaders in the city or the state um, to really help them to understand how, like how everything kind of functions and how everything works. And I think that's important um, so that they you know they have that experience and that opportunity to be a part of that. Thanks, Tony and Annette. You were going to chime in. Yeah, I. Something I've been thinking a lot about with the holidays and our, our work that we do is that we really have an opportunity to help people flip the narrative about the holidays a little bit. We, I, an awful lot of what I hear people talking about is all the loss that is happening around not having your same traditions, same people together. But you know, one of the things we know from, be, from the LGBTQ community is that many people don't have families that have had traditions where they have felt welcomed in and accepted. And this is really an opportunity for people, whether you're in a family that's very close or a family that isn't close, to create some new traditions and to look to other communities for traditions that will work for you. Um, the other thing I would say is like this, the narrative that I think a lot of public health folks are working on around um, physical isolation, but social connection is, so profoundly true, I think, for people who have access to Zoom, et cetera, that they may be able to bring people together for a specific ritual or a conversation that they never would be able to afford to bring together otherwise. So <clears throat> I never want to um, pretend that things aren't hard and people aren't challenging. Of course, doing suicide prevention, we really want to normalize having conversations about the struggle and what's hard. But I also think that we can come together to help people kind of lean into their creativity around how to engage with, with the holidays. Thank you all for sharing. I know we don't have uh, too much time left, but I did want to pose one more question. And Eddie, I was thinking about maybe uh, giving this question to you since you talked about policy. Um, so Sheila is posting in the chat right now about what are what do you see as the most relevant measures to drive policy and investment in your work? And I don't know if there's been specific measures you've all been looking at so far, but wanted to see if you have anything to add there. 
Yeah, no, thank you for the question, <clears throat> Sheila. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, when I think about measurement, I'm, I came from a healthcare quality measurement background. So I'm thinking very specific in that sense. Um, and there's a variety of um, health system quality measures that we are working on. And as I mentioned that project um, earlier, um, this international classification for function, um, disability and, um, uh, and health um, really will be the sort of framework for us to systematically measure um, uh, sort of uh, degrees of social isolation or, or disconnection. Um, and that will be the sort of the groundwork for creating quality measurement um, across social services, health services, and, and the like. Um, on the policy side, we are advocating um, for support to undergo that international classification with the World Health Organization. I know that's very specific, and I'm sure that wasn't exactly answering <laughs> your question, but one thing to think about. I open up to others to, to comment. Well, I think that was a helpful starting point and maybe it's something we can continue exploring on the next uh, session. So thank you all for joining us today. And I really appreciate the time of our guests and everything that was shared. You know, it was kind of putting the pieces together. You know, there were things around uh, technology, a lot around kind of the digital divide and technology innovations. And then Another dimension that really came up for me today was around uh, the, like the economic dimension, whether it's through Oregon's grant opportunity or it's through um, after school matters, youth, youth internships. We've really seen the importance of, of access to those kinds of opportunities in supporting social connection as well. Um, so those are just a few things that I feel like summarize things um, on my end. And I wanna go to the next slide and just close out with a few um, resources. If there's anything that would be helpful for all of you in terms of next steps, please share in the chat. Um, but you know, we've got the CDC technical packages that we mentioned earlier. Um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation actually has community grants that are focused on social connection and social isolation and taking innovations from other countries. So you can definitely check that out. Um, another resource here from a web conference that had uh, taken place. And we're going to share all of these resources out um, in our follow up with the recording. Um, one other piece here is uh, community development and the role that they have in terms of social isolation, encountering it. And lastly, uh, early childhood systems and the roles that they can play too. There's so many populations and sectors that we didn't touch on today. So um, definitely share in the chat if there's anything else that would be helpful for next steps. And we look forward to connecting again. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this concludes our webinar.